Welcome to the Rugby Pits podcast and happy 2023, happy Men's Rugby World Cup year. This is our first episode for 2023. Um, uh, my name is Tala and I'm joined by Jared and we're going to talk through um, some of the weekends or uh, some of the weekends rugby action focusing on the URC and also just previewing week three of the Champions Cup and Challenge Cup matches happening over the weekend. As always, we start with our first phase question. And this week's question was, we wanted to hear people's best or funniest stories of meeting a professional rugby player in person. So as always, the Dirt Trackers were great with their contributions um, of, 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 of these funny stories. I'll start with Martin Prince Lu's one, um, talking about him meeting um, his brother and him meeting Christian Cullen in the 20, 2011 Rugby World Cup and them complaining that France was robbed at, um, at the final. Um, another regular dirt tracker is Mitch Evans. He was talking about, well, he, he has a story of meeting um, Andrew Walker at a local club rugby grand final. Um, and that, the, that um, with beer in hand, the club chanted for him to score his beer, which he obliged, but took an age and he spilled the majority of the beer, which is, a bit unfortunate. Francois Stein has something to teach him about that then. Um, probably right, Jared? Yeah, definitely. He's he's a, um, a a legend at that. And I don't know if you saw um, Dylan Lays. He isn't too bad himself. He he chugged one this mm. weekend at La Rochelle. Yeah. Oh, did he? After the win against Toulouse? Yes, yes. First one in eight, I think. They lost eight on the trot to Toulouse and then yeah. eventually got one win. So good for them. Yeah, they've been really unlucky against that team. So let's just share a few of the others, then I'll, I'll go to you, Jared. So there is one from um, Rhea Wolf, who said he met Francois Hochard as a teenager. And they used to live in the same estate. I assume that was, that was in Pretoria. And that um, Francois Hochard also gave him a ride in his Nissan GTR. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very, I mean, especially he was 15, 16 at the time. I think that would be the coolest story ever for someone of that age. Yeah, exactly. He does say that it wasn't uh, really a funny one, but uh, a memorable one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, fair enough, fair play. I'd also try to uh, sneak that in whenever I had the opportunity to. Oh, 100%. Funny enough, a lot of Eben Itzbeth stories here. One from um, Ryan Berlowitz, who said he was knocked over by Eben when he was about 13, and he was <laughs> leaving the canal walk bathrooms as he was getting in. Yes, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to ever. Almost knock into someone as big as Evan Elizabeth at all. Yeah, and and the canal walk bathrooms are, are pretty like decent size, so I, I'm sure Elizabeth <laughs> takes up a hell of a lot of the walkways. <laughs> I don't. I'm not so overly oh, no surprised way. that has happened. <laughs> um, and then another Evan Elizabeth story from um, Frazzled Candy, who said that he met Evan Elizabeth and Scott Berger, and that they walked into the store that they worked at, and yeah. It also took the it also showed the photos for proof as well. I mean, that is a pretty awesome two day run here of meeting two of the what five or ten best Springboks ever. Yeah, exactly. And what's that like? One hundred and eighty test caps worth of Springbok over there. Yeah, the two of just them? about yeah. one hundred and eighty yeah. test caps, uh, two World Cups, two Lions series wins. Yeah, I'm just trying to go through all the achievements. A few. Premiership over, and top 14 wins, yeah. Over like 200 uh, premier, uh, Stormers caps as well, I'm sure. Mm. No, yeah. that, yeah. You're, you're doing pretty, pretty well for yourself if you have a day like that. Um, yeah. my, I have two stories. My first one is also talking about urinals. I see that um, at Mully's 296 said he stood next to a... Uh, so next to Gary Boat in the urinal at Hatfield in the early 2000s. I'm not going to talk about his allegation that Gary Boat looked or not. That's not for me to get into. <laughs> but I also had the opportunity to stand next to a, a Springbok um, as well, Francois Stein, who was next to me in the urinal in, um, in Stellenbosch. It was actually such a funny night. I remember I was actually about to go to sleep. It was a Saturday night and I was just like, um, there's nothing really happening in town. I'm going to go to bed. Got a message from... Um, a mate of mine, Dave Bryant, I think he also listens to the podcast once in a while, big rugby fan. And he said, Tala, get out of your bed, whatever you're doing. Francis Dane is at um, Terrace at the at one of the clubs in Stellenbosch. So I ran 
pretty much to 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 terrace which was like a 10 to 15 minute walk and yeah front stain was there i think it was a bachelor party from what i could pick up and if i'm not mistaken i think it was 2013 so i think he was injured and i think it was just before he signed to go um to play in france i think for montpellier so same as having the time of his life i don't think he had any requirements <laughs> for training or anything like that so he was drinking he obviously drank really fast and yeah, like we sort of shared a nod of acknowledgement then Urinals as well. I respected his space. I didn't look at him, he didn't look at me. But yeah, it was just a, a moment of just Francho Stein probably getting the student days that he never got because he started playing professional rugby when he was what, 12, 13, whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the thing is that I found funny about that is you said it was probably a bachelor party, but uh, knowing the Bloemfontein boys, it was just a normal night out, and that's how <laughs> that's how the night unfolded. Uh, yeah, I, I have a few yeah. Bloemfontein mates as well, and uh, yeah, when they party, they party hard. So it's not uh, not necessarily a bachelor party that they will <laughs> bring out the no, I ridiculous for. <laughs> I can definitely believe that, Chad. What's your story? Yeah, so um, it, it goes back to the story of, uh, you guys will give me a little bit more shit for this one, but it goes back to the story of staying at PSB's house when I went to go watch the Bulls game and uh, had a couple of drinks at the game, um, like feeling like well off my, off my rocker. And uh, we get back and there's guys um, sitting around the fire having a, um, a bride at the place where we're staying. And... Uh, we walked up to them and they told us, no, come, come join us for the bra like a real South African would normally do. They start pouring us brandies and that. They start speaking to us and uh, they're like, oh, yeah, so you like really into your rugby? And I'm like, yeah, I, I know a lot about rugby, like I follow it very well. And they're like, yes, you, you don't seem to know that much about rugby because uh, you've been sitting next to a Springbok captain for the last 20 minutes. And I look to the right of me and there's Cornet Cricker sitting next to me. <laughs> Oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, had far too much to drink and uh, was like completely out of it. And uh, there I am sitting next to Corne Krieger. Uh, oh, Corne was brilliant for the rest of the night. So I asked him, asked him all the questions that you would ask when you've got uh, liquid confidence. And uh, he, he <laughs> ended up phoning my father that night and saying, how's it to my dad? And phone my dad at about 12 o'clock at night <laughs> so yeah that's that's pretty much my story <laughs> oh my word i mean yeah i think we need to talk, talk about how much you were drinking that day if you couldn't recognize Cornegra next to you um or i, I, I don't know i maybe think just i was so out. tunnel vision and that i i hadn't seen anyone that wasn't directly in my eye line <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe, yeah, like I think some Springbok fans, you possibly blacked out the 2000 to 2003 era of the Springboks, unfortunately for, for Kone Krecher. Um, yeah, obviously wasn't the best time for him to be captain. But yeah, um, awesome on him to also um, give, give your, your old man a call as well. Yeah, it was, it was class, man. Brilliant guy. So, so yeah, if uh, Kone is listening to this by uh, any random chance, uh, thanks for listening. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for... Thanks for entertaining me for the night. <laughs> Shout out to the PSP's BNB. It seems like the place to be if you, yeah. you want to meet, you know, rugby celebrities. Jared, I mean, now we yeah. have also enough material to, to say that you're a Stormers fan now as well. Yeah, that's fine. That's, I suppose it's a bit <laughs> better than being a Bulls fan, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to tell a few of the other stories, um, there is... One where um, from Frick Brits, he said he was 11 and headed to Newlands to watch Storms versus Highlanders in the Super Rugby semi final of 1999. And um, they see um, Brian Lima walk into the hotel that they were at. And, he, and L Lima looks at them and asks who they're supporting today. And obviously, they're supporting the Stormers and, and told them good luck. Then there's another hotel story with JP Peterson, who gave a friend. Um, who um, Muli's friend um, tickets to the 2007 Super Rugby final, and yeah, he has a photo of him. Um, take, he has a photo of him, JP, AD Jacobs, and the Beast wearing his Bulls jersey. That probably was probably bad luck for the Sharks in, in reflection taking that photo with the Bulls fan there. Yeah, uh, not not a not a very smart move there. So. <laughs> 
No, I, I, I think they, they should probably take that one back. One yeah. more Eben Elizabeth story um, with Tambur, who was um, looking for a sports bar at the Oa Tambo to watch um, the Sharks. And um, he, 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 he walked into this bar and asked another, or walked into this place where asked this guy where he could watch some rugby. And then that he, he realized, sort of similar to Jared's story, he realized when he was walking away that, oh, this was Eben Elizabeth who was waiting to fly with the Stormers team to Australia. So he was just this guy that he tapped on the shoulder to be like, hey, what, where's the rugby happening here? So, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think this is even worse than your story because, I mean, Eben Elizabeth is, I mean, Kone Kruger, I mean, he's bigger than the normal person, but not that much bigger, but Elizabeth is yeah, uh, yeah a pretty big guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, Corne's also been retired for a pretty long time and he's kept himself pretty mm. fit, but he's not like a rugby flanker fit. He's more of like a running fit kind of guy. So, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think uh, he takes a the cake there. I definitely get a little bit of kudos on myself for that. I've seen that one. <laughs> I do yeah, hope I that you bring up story. this, uh, the Butch James story that you, I think you're about to read. <laughs> yeah, so these are the top two stories, I think, from from our contributions. So the first one is from at Tor Corbs, who said um, his buddy and, and him met Gather Stienk up at a shop in Bloemfontein when he was drawing money from an ATM. They were pretty junk and they were trying to hug Gather and Gather probably was like, what is going on? So he just basically walked away from, from the ATM and he left his cash in the withdrawal slot. So now these two are running after him, waving, their, <laughs> waving Gather's 500 grand, <laughs> trying to get him to give his money. Which, yeah, I think it's a fantastic story. Yeah, it, it seems like... It seems like if you uh, if you are uh, if you're a springbok, it's uh, you seem to attract the the drunken idiots. It, it seems. Uh. <laughs> no, there's yeah, there's no chance there. Unfortunately, you have to sort of you have to balance that. And unfortunately, especially if you're a springbok out on a Friday or Saturday night, there, there's not many chances there. Um, yeah, and then I think the the, the best story definitely goes to Tudor Davies. Um, he said he was at a bride in St. Francis around 2000 and Springbok World Cup winning fly half Butch James was there, probably Jared's number one favorite player as well. And yeah, apparently Butch James's party trick is that he stuffs, you know, his, 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 um, little rugby family bits, jewels. if we want to call it that, <laughs> his family jewels, that's great, um, into a beer glass and he goes up to people telling them he found a baby pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> and now, yeah, every time he sees Bush James or sees a pigeon, that story comes to mind for him as well. So unfortunately for, for Tudor, he has to watch Bush James or listen to Bush James every weekend um, in the rugby as well. And he'll always be known as the person who <laughs> <laughs> has this very interesting party trick that he does there. Yeah, I, I've I've always heard about uh, guys talking um, about Butch James' party trick, and they were always like, they don't go into details, but they'll say, "Have you seen Butch James' party <laughs> trick?" <laughs> oh, it's, it, it, it's sort of like an inside joke on some of these podcasts, and that that they appear on or <laughs> in interviews when when that happens. So, yeah, I, I I I love Butch James, but I don't think I want to see his party trick. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't know. No, not at it. all. I mean, it's, it's a very, look, you know, you, you, if you meet your heroes, you want to have a lasting memory and that will definitely give you a lasting memory of Butch James, to be fair. Yeah, exactly. So you don't, yeah, I think it's, it's not something that you want to avoid. I have um, also uh, one more story to wrap up. Um, I was at... Um, in, in, in res in university in 2012, we had this competition um, in the men's res called Mr. Dachbreak, which was the res I was at. So it was this modeling, I can't, I can't even call it a modeling competition, but it was this like basically a fundraising competition that we did with one of the women's raises in Stellenbosch and was supposed to basically find the Mr. Dachbreak of the year and the Sonop of the year. And obviously the seniors made the first years do it um, most, most of the time. So I get um, volunteered to do this against my will. And now I'm suddenly going to, you know, wear some of these clothes and, and, and sort of make a bit of a joke of myself and model in inverted commas um, for, for the people that were there. It was hosted at an old Stellenbosch nightclub, or at least old now at the time called um, Dolly's. Um, so they built a ramp and all that sort of stuff. So basically I was told that once you go on the ramp, just, you know, come with gears, come with energy, just, yeah. Get, get the crowd going basically. <laughs> so 
I'm, they also didn't tell us who the guest judges were. They, they was kept a bit of a secret. I'm now walking and I'm doing all sorts of crazy things and like, you know, trying to do as much as possible to get the crowd going. I get to the end of the ramp and I'm looking at the, the, the table of judges. It's, it's a senior of mine, a senior from the women's race, and it is Stormer Center, Joan de Jong, that is in the middle of this <laughs> um, judging panel. I, oh. I almost start laughing on the stage myself. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm completely embarrassing myself in front of Joan de Jong. I do my thing. I think they also had like a, um, a, a question and answer session like they do in like Miss South Africa. I can't remember what my question was. But then I basically made some sort of joke about, you know, uh, if I could have the skills or the dancing skills that Juan de Jong has on the rugby field, I'd be pretty happy. And that's probably the reason why I won Mr. Duck Play 2012. <laughs> and I also <laughs> by Juan de Jong. <laughs> so Juan always has a soft spot in my heart. And yeah, if Juan is also listening to this podcast today, I want to tell him thank you so much for awarding me Mr. Duck of 2012. I'll try to retweet it and um, it will put it on the Rugby Bits um, pod, but he even did acknowledge that this happened um, on a tweet uh, 10 years ago as well. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did not think that volunteering for this pretty stupid res event would have me meeting Juan de Jong. No, that's brilliant. And I can imagine that uh, he was heckling the whole way through the, the competition. And <laughs> I, I, out I some really verbal. want to... Yeah, I really wonder sometimes these things that like these like former or like at the time current Springboks and current like Stormers players do like in the community. Like, does someone call them up? Is it like a close mate? Is it just like an agent saying, look, you're sponsored by this company, you have to do this? Because I, I don't know if I was Ron DeYoung, maybe that's not the way I would spend my Wednesday or Thursday night <laughs> at the time. <laughs> No, exactly, exactly. I I wonder how they sign up or they get caught up to these things. <laughs> oh, shame, man. So I think let us now transition onto the rugby that happened this weekend, um, just to go through the results um, from Saturday's game. So the South African teams were all away in Europe um, for one weekend. Um, so this was the, I think, their fourth game in Europe for the season, and they, they all went to to play overseas. So we start with the Bulls, who, lo- who won sorry, 29 points to 14 against the Dragons. Munster won 33 points to 3 against the Lions. Benetton beat Ulster, I think, for the first time in four or five years, 31 points to 29. Edinburgh beat Zebra, 24-17. Scarlets, a bit of a surprising win against Cardiff, I think it's fair to say, 28-22. Connacht beat the Sharks, which was effectively a second team, 24 points to 12. Leinster beat Ospreys. A bit, a surprisingly close game, um, 19 points to 24. And then the game, probably the game of the weekend, was Glasgow beating the Stormers with a last-minute try to win 24 points to 17. So what we're going to do is just discuss the games a little bit, but also then just have a bit of a reflection on the season so far. Most teams have played at least 11 to 12 games. I think the Sharks and Lions are still at 10. And yeah, just see where the teams are in terms of the log, you know, what, what are their... How, how they've done the season and you know where they're going because for most teams they have about four or five games left until the end of the regular season so if you are trying to qualify for the top eight or get a home quarter final or win top or be top of the log you are running out of time so let's start with the bulls dragons game um as we said the bulls won 29 points to 14 with a pretty strong team probably close as close to a, a, a Bulls first team as, as we've seen um, in the last few months. And it seemed like, yeah, they, they, they got, they got an early lead and then the Dragons started coming back a little bit and then the Bulls just took the game away. And I think the first place to start Jared is I think with the, with the back line, you know, we finally, I think after a lot of, um, people um, asking for it, including myself. We had Wandi Simelani start in, in the midfield with Harold mm-hmm. Forster, Jan Huerson at 10. What is your impression of the back line um, in this game? Yeah, I, I think uh, you're right. It, it, it was nice to see Simelani back in um, the centres. Um, definitely belongs there. It's more favoured for him. I think he's always been an, a possibility on the wing, but not really a fullback. Um, and Jake's pretty much used him there just to get him on the pitch. So 
yeah, overall, uh, that's pretty close to the best Bulls backline that they, they can get. Um, I, I thought they had a decent game. Um, I think Johan Kursen uh, sets up a brilliant try for Kurtley Aronsa. And uh, what, what I did enjoy about that try is that you can hear Aronsa um, saying, goose 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 the whole time and normally you're asking for a goose step but uh, he's obviously just asking for the ball to get the ball back but uh i've all i i think it was a decent performance by the bulls backs um Quirson had a bit of issues with finding touch i think he missed about four four kicks uh to touch which uh yeah that, that cost the the bulls quite a bit um one of his kicks actually cost them directly like straight away um the Dragons uh, kicked the ball back, got a 50-22 and scored from the resulting line out. So, yeah, he, he wasn't uh, supposed to start the game. So I wonder if he was maybe you know, not quite ready or his mindset wasn't quite uh, there to be starting the match. But uh, when you called upon, you need to step up. So, yeah, he'll be disappointed with that. But in the in the Bulls, actually, the Bulls won. So, um, yeah, you can't, be, you can't be too critical about it, I suppose. Yeah, I think let's maybe just going on to uh, staying with the backline a little bit. Let's talk about someone's a bit of an unsung hero, especially in the last two seasons and that Bulls backline. That's uh, you can also argue there's another one that played at eleven, which is David Creel. But one I want to focus on is Harold Forster. Um, he mm. had a great season last season, and he was just a, a part of most of the good things that the Bulls did, and some of the surprisingly attacking rugby that the Bulls played last se- the Bulls attack played last season, but. Had a bit of a slow start this season, and I think he's this game was a as a game that shows that he's getting back into confidence and getting back to form. Most defenders beaten in the game with six, made his fair share of tackles with nine. You know, he carried for fifty one meters. Like that's mm. quite a busy game from the midfielder. Yeah, I, I think I've always rated Foster to be to be honest. Uh, I thought it was a bit of a blow when he went to Japan. Um, yeah, the Lions have had a lot of blows over the over the years, but. Uh, I think for South African rugby, it was a bit of a blow that uh, he left to go to Japan. Um, but yeah, you must, like we must remember, he played under he played inside centre under uh, Swayze's brain. So Swayze isn't going to have a twelve that's just going to truck it up. So he, he he has got a very well-rounded game for such a big um, inside centre, and he's starting when he's confident. He's he's one of the best insides in in South Africa. So. I, I'm I'm glad he's getting back to that kind of form. Um, he, yeah, I've, I've just spoken about all his softer skills and that uh, he's a well-rounded player. But then uh, his try against the Dragons was old-school bulldozing work. So at least he's got that in his in his armory as well. And then just going up front, a, a great performance from Jan Krobla. You know, twelve tackles, two turnovers. He's quite busy in the field. I want to ask you, Jared, about the Bulls loose trio. Um, obviously, Marcel Kutsia, another favorite player of yours. Hopefully, he doesn't have any party tricks of his own, but he's <laughs> gone to Japan for part of the season. So they are probably going to go for this loose trio. is probably going to be the loose trio for their first choice loose trio for most of the games, which is Marco van Stad and Carl Brink and Al Klo. You know, what, yeah, what do you think are the things that this loose trio does? You know, is it the best loose trio? Does, does Brink... And Van Staden kind of replace what um, Marcel Kutsia does well. I think if you have both of them on the pitch at the same time, they they do. Um, like, you know, I, I always uh, wax a recall about Marcel Kutsia, but uh, he is a he is a that he does it all on the pitch. So, yeah, with Brink, you you do get uh, a little bit uh, closer to that ball carrying threat that Marcel brings, and Marco's actually quite a bit better on the ground than Marcel is. Um, and he's also quite a big ball carrier. So once you add them both to the equation with Arik I think the Bulls have a pretty powerful um, loose trio with them. Um, and some of the other guys that they they played against, Leon and um, in the Curry Cup, and I think the ones, um, Walt um, unless I know, I might be getting the players confused there, but... Uh, he also stepped up and showed that he's capable of making making it at URC level and could come into that bench spot um, traveling Nizam Kaf for, for that slot. So, 
yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Ari Klo um, as well. He's really growing on me, and uh, yeah, he seems to get stuck into the nitty gritty of it and get into players' faces, which uh, is always uh, it was always always fun to see. So, <laughs> yeah, and it was another man of the match performance from him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it was man of the match from from his side as well. And yeah, we know from the last two week or the last few sorry two years not two weeks that he's been near the top of the performers for for the Bulls as well. So mm -hmm. looking at some of the stats from the Bulls during the course of their season, you'll see like if you go to the URC statistics, you go to the URC website and go on stats, you can see some of the team statistics. So it tells a pretty good story attacking wise for the Bulls. They have the second best attack um, according to the URC stats just after Leinster. Second for points scored, fourth for offloads, second for clean breaks, third for tries scored and meters gained, respectively. Of course, you know, having the likes of Kirtley Arensa, Huan Kwerson, and um, Kanan Moody helps a lot with that. Defense is not great. It's at 11th. And mm. you, when you, the, the big thing that they're going to be concerned about is their scrum, which I think has improved from last season, but is still only number 13th in terms of scrum efficiency. So that, is the number of scrums they, they win and lose. Their scrum win and winning percentage is only 13th um, at um, 89%. And their line-out has actually gone down at 11th as well. So it seems like the Bulls, yeah, there's, there's, the attack is going well. Um, and especially given that they've had a lot of changes week to week with their team because um, of Jake White rotating his squad, I think arguably quite well, um, you know, for the long run. But the main concern that I have um, for the Bulls, and I'd like to ask you what your, your, your concern might be, is yes, it seems like they're winning, so that's good, of course, and they're in the top four, so they'd be still aiming for at least a home quarterfinal. But they need to find their best team um, sooner rather than later, especially mm. after that um, Six Nations break where they have the home derbies, because once they get into the knockouts for the Champions Cup and you know probably a knockout game, at least in the URC, they need to know who their best combinations are. And yeah, you mm. saw it, I think, with Kusin, as you said, with his performance at 10. Maybe he's not quite familiar with, you know, or wasn't prepared for, for Friday's game. But yeah, it, it seems like the Bulls team just needs to find out what their best halfback combination is, their best midfield, you know, who's going to be um, playing for them up front with them, Jan Krobola, et cetera, et cetera. So those combinations need to start playing with each other. So maybe these run of games... After the, the the Champions Cup games, now they'll start maybe picking the the, the combinations one, once they have a run of two or three home games um, and derby games that they play. Yeah, I, I think you I think you're right, Tala. Um, I think the one thing Jake's trying to do is he's trying to replicate what uh, Leo Cullen has at uh, Leinster, where he's able to mix and match his um, his Ireland internationals with uh, his squad players and bring in academy players at the same time. So I think Jake's trying to do that. Um, and that's sort of why we all think that uh, his teams are very inconsistent and like all over the place. But I think if he knows um, his best combinations and the players know the best combinations, um, they're in a good place. And if they do drop off one of those players through injury or suspension or whatever, the next guy is pretty comfortable in the systems and it's more of a system-based uh, approach than a combination. So I think that's what Jake is trying to get right. Um, and yeah, chopping and changing your team can eventually lead to that. Um, I th uh, it showed against the Dragons that uh, they do have a pretty decent scrum. Um, but like we say, it's, when you're changing guys, you do get a little bit of inconsistencies and... Uh, I think that's sort of why their their scrum one loss percentage is is quite low. Um, the the one thing I did find quite interesting is that the Bulls rank second for um, scrum penalties one in the entire competition, which is a pretty yeah. surprising stat. And uh, yeah, they they did show some dominance uh, over the the Dragons in that facet of play, and it was a it was a regular thing across the board for the South Africans this weekend. Yeah, I think you can see that there's a definitely a, a strength of scrumming that they have, especially with against the overseas teams. And it's so weird that they have, you know, so many scrum penalties won, but 
they still lose. It seems like the, mm. the problem is that they still lose a big share of their scrums um, regardless of that. So you don't want your scrum one percentage to be under 90%. I think that's the point of departure. You can look yeah, at, I think if, um, uh, if you're scrum, looking... If you if you're looking to be a championship winning team, you want to be hitting about ninety six, ninety seven percent as high as yeah. that. Um, you you almost don't want you want the odd one to go to go um, to the opposite opposition, but not many. Yeah, discipline's also a bit concerning. Um, nine yellow yeah. cards so far in the competition, one red card, not too great with like the penalties. I mean and. I think that tells the story of the scrums, which they have 23 scrum offenses that they've committed. But let's move on to, uh, yeah, yeah, I think the final, quick final thing to say of the Bulls is just as I mentioned now that they are fourth in the URC table, they're, um, or third, sorry, in the URC table. They're seven points behind the Stormers. So they could still have some aspirations at, at t- making that top two. Um, that, that would assure them a home semi final if they win their games. But yeah, they're tied with Ulster, but they've played one more game. So they, I think they should be, their aim should be, how can we catch the Stormers and, and win the South African Shield? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I, I do. Th- we'll get onto them later, but uh, I think the, the Sharks, um, that two games that they have to catch up will be a big deciding factor in the South African mm-hmm. Shield. And uh, yeah, that's sort of outside of the Bulls' control now. Yeah. So let's move on to the Lions, who lost 33 points to three against Munster. Yeah, not too much positive that can be said from this game. And I think the Lions were, were also kind of, not really rotating, but you can just see the, that the lack of depth that they have compared to the other three South African teams. And that, that's showing off in, in this particular game. Jared, yeah, I think... The, the main thing that can be said here is it was a very busy day in terms of tackling stats. Um, you mm. see someone like um, um, Emil van Heerd and the, the, the blindside flank for the Lions, according to the Ultimate Rugby Stats, made 30 tackles on, on Friday night. Goodness gracious me. I mean, even the prop, I said, uh, it's in Club of Gagne. Y- yeah, yeah, sorry. I it, mean, it was Emil's debut, which is also quite impressive. Um, first URC game and he what well, stands up with 30 tackles or 31 tackles. It's yeah, pretty insane. That is absolutely crazy. I mean, yeah, Fenerden, if I'm not mistaken, he's from the Sharks, right? Yes, yes. And his dad's a uh, Springbok. Oh, who is he? Uh, I'm, I'll double check and get back to you. <laughs> it was fun here. But yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> that's good uh, I, I think you you could be a private eye investigator with that sort of like um, investigative <laughs> conclusions there just a, a quick one as well I, I was just mentioning it now Asenatin Klabakanye he's the 22 year old tight head prop for the Lions he's a massive 123 kilograms um, yeah he's a big piece of meat but I, I was able to watch the Lions and the Stormers game um, on New Year's Eve um, the weekend before he gets through a lot of work um, on yeah. the field. And I mean, yeah, for such a big bodied guy, I mean, he does his fair share. And even in this game, 18 tackles made, two turnovers. Like, he definitely gets through his work. And I think mm. the Lions uh, pride themselves with, you know, how m- mobile their props are. Even Jean Pierre Smith is someone that usually gets through a lot of work, especially in the attack. But yeah, I think, Jared, we can, yeah, if you have anything about the, the, the game itself. But I think broadly, I think the Lions after quite a hot start. So just, yeah, the, the, the squad is wearing a bit thin and it's difficult for them to keep, you know, the level of quality that they need to in order to break into that top eight. Yeah, I think it's exactly that. Um, it, I think one of the big positives that can take away from the match is that uh, they they dominated the scrums as well. So like I said, it was a pretty good weekend for the South African scrums. And um, yeah, the, the lines were... We're probably not as rewarded as much as they would have liked to have been. Um, they were driving Munster back on most scrums. I don't want to say all, but most. They were putting them under the pump and they didn't get too many penalties from it. So, yeah, when you're not always getting rewarded when you feel like that, uh, that you should, um, it does become a bit difficult. I think there was a stage where they probably should have gotten um, a penalty trial awarded to them and they didn't. Um, 
so yeah, I I, I do think uh, Jordan Hendricks uh, isn't controlling the game as as well as he maybe should be at this stage in his career, um, considering how many games he's started for the Lions and has taken over that responsibility. So I think uh, that's one of their big work ons that uh, him and Lombard really need to start dictating play. And if they can't, then he start looking at their scrum offs to to get that done. And uh, I think somebody like Nohamba is maybe a bit better at that. Uh, just he's got a bit of more of a domineering voice on the pitch, and yeah, maybe they're missing him a bit. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think you sort of hit it, the nail on the head that uh, they're starting to wear a bit thin, and uh, they don't quite have the depth as some of the other teams do. Yeah, and I mean, I I, I criticized them early in the season, but I think. You can say there's a there's maybe um, a player that obviously is much more lined in South African rugby circles, but the, the backline might be that sort of experienced hand from Andres Kutsia. I think just someone that can help with the option taking, help with when to mm. attack, when to defend, when to kick. It's interesting just looking at the stats, the lines, the two places that they do quite well compared to other teams is discipline. So they, you know, haven't had a red card. They've only had seven yellow cards. Conceded a lot of penalties, uh, or conceded sorry the least penalty or second least penalties sorry uh, with 102, and their kicking has been quite good. Um, pace kicking has been great, and their kick meters surprisingly they're at you know third for kick meters, but they kick much less. They kick only ten times. Oh, they 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 tenth for kicks from hand, but um, third for kicking meters. So they when they kick they kick quite far. So. You know, maybe mm. that would help just bring the pressure off um, the attacking game because you can see that they're still trying to basically, you know, play like at the up tempo rugby and 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 keep the ball in hand and, and and all this sort of stuff. And they obviously have a lot of talented players, but maybe just that option taking of you know, let's kick and yeah, the the likes of Lombard and Hendricks are just need to be able to be wiser with that in order to really get their their team um go forward ball and and and. Play the, and, and play the game in the right areas. No, I, I think you're right. Um, I think that kicking meters stat is helped by the fact that they play on the half fault. Um, I think you can probably <laughs> put an extra thousand meters on there just because of that. But uh, their kicks retained at being right near the end of the competition is a bit of an issue. So, yeah, we always say you're kicking for a cause. Um, even if you not particularly want to retain the ball and you want to apply pressure every now and then, you should be retaining the ball based on that pressure and you're forcing errors out of the opposition. So, yeah, it's uh, their kicking game obviously needs some some adjustments. And, yeah, it's a, I, th- I think it's a bit difficult when you have um, two youngish flyoffs uh, operating as your first choice tends. Yeah, I think it wouldn't be too much of a surprise to hear that the Lions are near the bottom for defense. You know, they've they tackle success as literally bottom of the competition. They've lost, you know, the second most turnovers and only won like two, um, 68 turnovers just compared to like teams on near the high 80s uh, in most of the competition. But the surprising thing would be the attack being quite low. You would think that the Lions would be near the top of that, or at least in the middle of the pack. But points scored, they're quite low, so they're not really capitalizing on the opportunities that they maybe create or maybe are trying to create from too deep. But interesting thing there is last for try scored with 27, last for meters gained, 14 for clean breaks, which is 14th out of 16. So it seems like you know for all the the, the 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 pretty play that they usually have, they're just not really building enough phases together in order to really break open the the, the the opposition. And you can see even from this weekend's games that just with like in terms of the the, the statistics, like the territory in the second half for months there was seventy five percent, and yeah, <laughs> so they're clearly not able to play in the right areas of the of the, of the field. Yeah, yeah, and again, that comes back to your kicking game sort of thing, and uh, also your set pieces, possibly your line out if you're not able to retain your own ball and uh, clear out kind of thing. So, yeah, I, th- I, th- I hope we're not just going to come back to the same thing with the lines, but it's just sort of 
they, their kicking game will have to improve for them to actually get a uh, improve in the in the competition and mm. yeah move up the move up the standings and uh if Swayce the brain just happens to listen to this uh yeah you, you do have to <laughs> kick every now and then Swayce. <laughs> uh, not cash fun rain no no i'm I'm talking about Swayce. he's still going to be supporting the lions i know he's not coaching them anymore <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know in the, ma- in the, in the, what do you call it? That, that program, the master, the, the, the game yes, plan yes, that yes, they yes. have. Yeah. Swayze will always be like, you know, you know, you have to keep the ball in hand. Like he's definitely uh, a big um, proponent of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just on a, f- a more positive note with the team. Yeah. Most impressive of, of the youngsters that the Lions have played this season. I think in terms of nominations, you can have um, Kian Horn, Heko van Veik. Uh, yeah. Emmanuel Chituka, the, the the fly halves, um, Ron Fenter, even though he didn't play on Saturday, like yeah, which one of those younger players have impressed you the most? Uh, th- I, th- I think Fenter. Hey, um, he's he's been really <laughs> really impressive. I think he's taken mm. his uh, opportunity really really well, and uh, he's been putting some of the some British and Irish lines to shame. So. Yeah, when mm. you can do that, and at 19 years old, I'm sure it was the season that he bounced off uh, Hamish Watson, and yes, there was a few others that uh, he took some took some uh, yeah shine off of. So I, I I think he's a real talent for the future, and it's just a matter of um, when he becomes a Springbok and not if. Um, but we'll probably have to wait until 2024 for that one. Mm. Yeah, look, I think also just having the opportunity to watch him live, he's also, he's he's got a boat on him as well. So mm. he's not just mm. there for the big hits. He really does get a, get around. He was there putting pressure on the Stormers' um, uh, ruck as well. I think he made a turnover or two last weekend in the Stormers' game. Um, unfortunately, obviously, he didn't play. And, you know, I mean, Emil van Heerden also, you know, played really well in that number seven jersey. But, yeah, I think, you know, anyone you put in a number seven jersey, um, from a South African team will probably look really good. Um, my one would probably be Kion Horn. I think he's just yeah. such a good attacker. There's, I don't, I don't, yeah, um, probably a bit offensive to say in our South African rugby podcast, but there's something a bit Kiwi about him, just how he runs yeah. and how he takes gaps. And he just is, 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 is able to create for other people as well. I don't know, a little bit Ben Smithish, if you want to stretch it to that, but yeah, he just has that ability to, snake through a gap himself and to also put people outside um, through as well. So, you know, on the wing or playing at fullback, I think he he will always make his impact known in a game. Yeah, I, I, I can I can agree with that one. Uh, I've liked what he's done this season. He, I think you, you're you not far off of putting him in that Kiwi bracket. He's a very intelligent outside back. He's not uh, one of the guys that will just tuck it and try burn somebody on the outside or try to beat somebody with pace. He's, he's very aware of what's going on around him. And yeah, he wants to make the most of the opportunity, whether it's him scoring or somebody else scoring. So yeah, I can see that. I think he's also another player that's got a very bright future and hopefully the Lions can actually hold on to him for a while before the, mm. the sharks or bulls come sniffing. <laughs> <laughs> and they will come sniffing, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. Let's move on to the Sharks. Um, they, speaking of, they lost 24 points to 12 to Connacht. They pretty much played their second team in this game and saving their players for the, the, the Champions Cup game play, happening this weekend. Jared, just, yeah, uh, I think there's not too much we can say about it from a wider season perspective, but yeah, just your thoughts uh, on the game. Yeah, uh, again, it was nice to see um, a good scrum from from the guys. So yeah, even... Uh, I said, we say it's an under strength uh, side, but if you look at that front row, like you'd be pretty happy with that front mm. row starting just about any um, any Sharks match. Um, but mm. even with Pauli in the second row out of position, you can have some issues when uh, you have a, a a a loose forward moving into the into the engine room and didn't look like it at all. So yeah, that was a good positive from the Sharks and um, yeah the, I think there were quite a few players that sort of uh, stuck their hand up um, Murray Costa I think was was trying quite a bit on on defense um, some of the tries that Connock scored the um, amount of effort 
that was put on defense by the sharks and like trying to scramble and stop the stop the uh, stop Connacht from scoring it you can see the effort was there and the guys were actually trying to to make the best of their opportunities but well, a lot of them it just didn't it didn't pan out and yeah you can only do so much i suppose and uh yeah, there was, there was that other try that the Sharks scored where Grant Williams was offside when he got the ball. And yeah, just unfortunately, again, just one of those things. He, yeah, it was an instinctive grab at the ball. He was offside. It was the right decision, but you can't do much about it. <laughs> yeah, I think it, yeah, just looking at it uh, from a statistical point of view, I, well, I think the first thing to say is that you know, I think the, the the title of the podcast this weekend might be <laughs> at least our scrums are good because I think that was basically the main positive to take out from all yeah. of the games. If you look at the score, I think it could have been a hell of a lot worse for the Sharks. Um, they could mm-hmm. have got an absolute pull team. And um, when you actually go watch the game, it could have been a lot better for the Sharks because I think there was a few opportunities that they just, they were just a, a centimeter off from capitalizing on or just a little bit. Uh, yeah, not you, you don't know the the guy next to you um as well as maybe the, the first team starters would. So it's a bit of a mixed team. Mm. So yeah. Yeah, and I mean the stats were relatively even, um, given that yeah, I mean the sharks were ahead with territory and possession. Obviously, in the second half, Connacht had the lead, so the sharks had more of the ball. But in terms of most of the other stats, everything was relatively even in terms of like, you know, they missed pretty much the same number of tackles. They mo- made more or less the same number of defenders beaten. Um, rack success was great. Lineout seemed like it was a bit dodgy for both sides. It seemed like just from what seeing some of the tweets that Fez and Butter's lineout, um, lineout throwing still needs a bit of work, unfortunately. But yeah, that's probably also not helped by the Sharks having probably only one recognized um block in, in 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 the team for the for the day that, that probably didn't help things um yeah i think the i mean you, you can't really complain too much about you know how how that particular sharks team did and then just from a wider perspective the sharks are currently at um ninth in the in the urc they obviously had a really rough start they lost their coach obviously the coach got fired at some stage but yeah they ninth place 29 points one point outside of the top eight um and they have two games in hand over most of them so they win those two games in hand in theory they could be in the top four so sharks would probably be pretty happy with you know still being in strong contention they've won their two champions cup games even though they had quite a rough start but yeah, I think Jared, just looking through, you know, the stats, uh, the Sharks are. I think they, they, there's things that they that are probably going to improve now. You know, like um, in terms of the attacking efficiency, especially. But you know, we've had a few games of the Neil Powell era. Even the, I mean, Dre Mahalo was probably the coach uh, for this weekend's game. In terms of Neil Powell era, Jared, what what are the things that you are impressed by? What are the things that you think the Sharks need to work on? Yeah, I, I think uh, we can't read too much into the stats because Neil wasn't involved from the start of it. Um, I, I would actually like to have a look at the trial file and the stats uh, from when he took over and like compare them to the rest mm-hmm. of the league. Um, we, that would that would be handy, but unfortunately we don't have that. But overall, the Sharks' performances ha- outside of this weekend have looked a lot more sharper. They seem to have a bit more direction. Um, someone like Kerwin Bosch looks like a man on a mission and he sort of yeah I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself with Kerwin because uh, I think he's <laughs> extremely talented and he could be a world beater but uh, yeah I just don't want to get too <laughs> too much into that just yet but uh, he, he looks like a you man on a both. mission he, he looks mm-hmm. like he's been well equipped in the analysis room and yeah the Sharks just look sharper uh, smarter and yeah a bit more ruthless um so yeah, but that also does help when you've got Sia Khaleesi and you have an Esabeth in your pack. So. <laughs> yeah. The more time they have them on the pitch, the better <laughs> for them. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the big thing for the Sharks will be going into these games. They they actually do maybe have a bit more um, with winning their two Champions Cup games. They possibly could go a bit, 
you know, rest rest up their players for these next two games because usually two games, winning two games in the in this four game format means that you qualify for the last sixteen. So if they don't really mind about traveling for their last sixteen game, they they could sort of rest rest their players and you know the the Springboks obviously have that that sort of resting program that they have. But yeah, I think the big thing will be just them getting consistency from just playing their their, their players together and having you know, following whatever the plan is from Neil Powell. But yeah, I think you're right, Jared. It's a lot more direct. It seems just a lot more clear. We're not asking the questions that we did, you know, two or so months ago of what are the Sharks trying to do, you know, from phase to phase and from game to game now. So that's a big positive. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty spot on. And uh, yeah, I, I spoke about the Bulls earlier and that uh, they can... Uh, well, Jake's trying to get to that position where he can throw youngsters in amongst with um, some of the senior players. And the Sharks can very much do that as well. Um, they mm-hmm. can, yeah, when when somebody like Ox needs needs a bit of a rest, they can um, throw Mushuni in there and he will certainly, he won't let the team down. If you need rest. No, um, not at all. Yeah, if you need a rest, Thomas Titoy, Carly Sardi is a tank of a man and could, easily slot back in so yeah they've like Renio here who also had a very good game for the for the Sharks this past weekend so yeah it just shows they do have quite a lot of depth and uh if they they can push on in both competitions if they really want to or they really capitalize on their chances yeah so it's interesting to see what the Sharks will do Let's finally go to the Stormers they lost in the last seconds um 24 points to 17 to Glasgow yeah, I think Chad, I think both of us only saw the highlights of this game, but yeah, <laughs> Hugh Jones yeah. and Sammy Tupelotu were absolutely brilliant. Just seeing like the the tries that were scored, I saw that they're being named Hugh Pulotu, which is their sort of center nickname. I don't mind that. That's not <laughs> a bad nickname actually for them. No, it's not too bad. Um, but you you can like just from the tries that I saw, like you can just sort of see Franco Smith written all over this Glasgow team. Mm. Okay? Um, Mm. Yeah, they just they just want to attack, um, sort of like the the cheaters teams that uh, he coached. And yeah, yeah, I suppose you could you could say the same about his Italy team that uh, just didn't want to give up the ball. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, I, I think the the Stormers sort of had a bad day on defense. From what I read, uh, Davo say about the game, um, he saw he said that uh, they were too focused on the defensive breakdown and uh, trying to force turnovers. And uh, yeah. Glasgow were quick enough to the ball to get it out and sort of tear them to shreds. So, so yeah, um, any Franco Smith Todd can tear just about any um, defensive part on their day. And I think uh, mm. it was Glasgow's day. <laughs> yeah, no, Glasgow is definitely on the up. They've had really good results. They won the 1872 Cup against Edinburgh. They're mm. now right in the in the middle of the, the chasing pack. Um, in, in the URC as well. Stormers, though, are second. They're basically the main contenders to Leinster for top of the mm. URC. They're nine points behind. Leinster obviously haven't lost a game, um, but the Stormers have one draw and two losses, so they're 11 points behind. You know, Glasgow's, by the way, just um, their fifth, just um, four points behind the Bulls on Ulster. So I think just from a wider perspective, interesting that the Stormers, first of all, played their basically their best team in this game. You know, mm. the uh, the 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 Bulls also played their best team, but they didn't play their their best team in the game before. So it's interesting just to see the the different strategies for resting and playing and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, the likes of Kitsov, Damien Willemser, they all took this trip to Glasgow, and yeah, they at least their um, Champions Cup game will be um, in Europe this weekend. So we'll we'll see if that if that makes a difference, but. I saw from AP Kronia, he was saying that maybe the Stormers aren't really ma- aren't managing their um, Springbok players as well as maybe the Bulls and to an extent the Sharks are doing because they're playing every week. Yeah, I, I think so, and that might come back to bite them a bit later. Um, as yeah, like as we spoke about earlier, is there is a mandate from the Springboks that they have to rest these players, and as far as I understand it, um, some of the Springbok players will be. Uh, are being topped up by SA Rugby with uh, as the player of interest to the national team. Mm-hmm. So, 
yeah, eventually they will have to rest some of them, um, whether guys like Marni Lebok and uh, Theon Fury um, fit in that bracket, I, I have no idea. So, yeah, maybe it might come back to bite him a bit later. But when you look at it, and we've heard about some of the traveling struggles that the Stormers had last season when they won the URC, it's quite mm-hmm. possible that they sent their best side over and played their best team because they had 25 or 26 players that went over and are going to go over to London next this weekend to play this match. So that could be a reason why they've, they've selected such strong squads this week and a strong squad for this week uh, weekend coming up. Yeah, possibly. I, yeah, we'll have to just see how these things go. And as we've seen in the last week or so in the news, um, I think a lot more of the South African teams and coaches are complaining about the travel situation in the URC that mm. they have to basically travel through Qatar in order to get to um in, in order to get into Europe. They have to travel in economy class. So yeah, there's a few issues as to, that will I think longer term we I think Saru and the URC and the franchise have to look at because shame I, I don't want Stephen Kitzel sitting in an economy class seat um on a 40 hour trip. Mm. No, you, you would want a private plane just to take him and France Mar over wherever they need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and imagine if Kitzoff is in the middle seat and you're, you know, the person next to him. Like, yes, I don't, I, I would not, I would not even try to fight for that armrest. I would say, look, whatever you want, sir. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and imagine you'd try to book the middle seat hoping that nobody will want to sit either side of you and you end up getting yeah. Stephen and uh, France. <laughs> <laughs> No, so yeah, that that has to be definitely fixed as well. But yeah, I mean, look, the storm is. I don't think there's too much that can be said negatively about it. Yeah, like mm. you mentioned, Jared, probably not the best away team at the moment. Then they might be maybe not as consistent. But you know, in terms of most of the stats, they're near the top for them. And funny enough, their defense is 13th, which is a bit surprising when you think of a team that's second in the log, like they. They 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 lose you know a bit more of the turnovers. They don't generate as many turnovers as you think they would having Dion Ferry in the team. But obviously that shows it it should be a team effort. So there's they 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 lose something there. But most of the other stuff is actually a bit more. Yeah, not 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 too impressive, but not also too bad. Like in the fifth mm. to tenth range is is uh, with like the lineouts, the scrums. Their defense is, yeah, the defense is probably the one thing that's a bit concerning. I think, yeah, and even their kicking game, but we know that's probably more through design that they don't really kick that much. Their kicking meters is only mm. 6,000 compared to the 9,000 9, that the Lions had. So it seems like the plan is going well for the Stormers. They seem to have mm. leaned more into their attacking game plan. But I think the biggest thing that they want to achieve I think in the next few months is to get their main players like Evan Ruiz healthy and totally make sure that they can manage their spring box to the end of um, to the end of the season as well because the expectations now in Cape Town are definitely for them to be you know competing for if not winning the URC again and the Champions mm. Cup they should be near the end of that yeah I, I, I think that's fair enough um, I think we sort of we kept on speaking last year or last season about the Stormers, like why are they still winning? Why are they still winning? Like uh, we can't explain <laughs> it. And uh, it's just the truth. It's uh, we are shocked like every weekend and every weekend we said, no, they're going to lose this weekend and they would come up and uh, surprise us. And eventually it just didn't become a surprise and we sort of expect them to do well now. And if you think about it, they, they've lost two games, they've drawn one and They've got a game in hand over Leinster and mm. Leinster lead them by 11 log points. So, yeah, if, to be trailing uh, Leinster by 11 log points after 12, 11, 12 games isn't too bad. Leinster generally start the season firing and just fire all the way through and then you sort of have to take your chance against them in a quarterfinal to try and knock them out or a semifinal and, or even try to roll them in the finals so yeah that the juggernauts of Leinster is pretty difficult to beat during the season but and not everyone can go 12 out of 12 and yeah we see that yeah and i think the big thing for the stormers is 
France Malabre, I think, has only played, if I'm counting correctly, I think only two URC games for them. So, you know, especially things like their scrum percentages, which are in the middle of the pack, that will improve a ton once, you know, he gets back into the team. Um, yeah, and the fact that they, if, if the Stormers are playing at home, I don't think there's any team really that would fancy their chances of beating them in Cape Town at the moment. So, mm. you know, if they can pretty much stay in that top two, I think that's at least the main goal is to be in the top two. But if they if they are able to get first so that, you know, I don't think Leinster will be playing their second or they'll be playing Harry Byrne instead of Johnny Sexton if they have a semifinal against the Bulls again. So yeah, if they 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 as far as possible want to avoid the possibility of traveling overseas for their final, if you know they go there far. No, exactly, exactly, and uh, I think the main goal for the South African teams is to sort of finish in the in the top four. Top place would be mm. nice, but uh, yeah, I keep on saying it. But Leinster, like while maintained in the league, they've got a serious depth that's pretty much unmatched across the sixteen yeah. teams and. Yeah, you're just not going to... Ospreys uh, came very close this weekend and once Leinster bought on some of the internationals off of the bench, it just became a different yeah, like, game and Leinster just snatched it away The whole world player of the them. years on their bench. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly that. I mean, Ospreys uh, actually played a fantastic game. I, I managed to watch that one and uh, mm. their scrum, again, talk a bit, of, a bit more about scrums because, uh, <laughs> because we can... But uh, yeah, it, Nicky Smith absolutely popped uh, Mark Eller. Michael Eller. Jeez. Yeah, and I, I haven't. I put it out on Twitter. I haven't seen that ever happen to him. Um, you know, he's a pretty solid bloke, and uh, yeah, he managed to do that. And the Ospreys had them pretty much under the pump. I think they were ten 0 up after about twenty minutes or something like that, mm. and they had only ten phases on attack. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, not going to international rugby, but I think looking forward to you know September twenty twenty three. But yeah, Kian Healy and Dan Sheehan being in a front row that gets manhandled like that by Ospreys is not a good sign for Ireland. So I'm sure Andy Definitely. Farrell will have a few sleepless nights about that. So I think let's start wrapping up with looking at this weekend's games in the Challenge Cup and the Champions Cup. Quickly in the Challenge Cup, we have the Lions going away to France to, and to Paris going to play Stade France. And um, the Cheetahs are playing Scarlets at Wales this weekend. Lions are actually quite well placed in the in the Challenge Cup. They are second in their pool. They've got eight points. So yeah, yeah. Uh, probably one a win in, in one of their next two games. Uh, that will definitely set them up to be near the top and playing their knockout game from home. So that's great. The Cheetahs, on the other hand, they have one win. And yeah, anything if they can get a second win, they they probably also be um, qualifying. So yeah, I think good prospects for both teams. But obviously, both teams don't have you know the depth and the quality that uh, that um, the top three South African teams have. So tough, tough to see um, Stade France and or Scarlets losing um, at home this weekend. Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what uh, approach they come with. I think uh, instead of flying pretty high in the top 14. I think they near in the top four, something like that. The table is quite tight this year. So yeah, they, they playing quite well. They've got uh, Vincent Koch there. They've got Jeremy Ward mm. there. So, so yeah, um, if they throw out their big guns, they just check they second in the, in the top 14 standings. Yes. If they throw out their big guns, then yeah, it could, it might turn into a bit of an ugly score line for the Lions. Um, and yeah, I, I think the Scarlets might uh, turn their attention into trying to rise up the URC rankings. But yeah, two wins from two, they might uh, they might let one of these games slip. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of whether it's this weekend or the next weekend. Yeah, I think the Lions are probably going to be targeting that Dragons game the next weekend yes. more so than Stade yeah. France. Unless yeah. Stade France decides to play their you know, under 13s and and whatever the French teams do. Then in the Champions Cup, at least from a South African perspective, um, we have Shark, the Sharks playing against Bordeaux on Saturday in Durban. The Bulls are playing the evening against Exeter at Loftus. And then on Sunday, um, the Stormers are going to play um, London Irish um, away from home. So the situation for the three teams are, 
who would have thought this early in the season, but the Sharks are the ones sitting pretty. They're, <laughs> you know, two from two in their um, Champions Cup games. They could probably start looking ahead and, and seeing if they can like rotate and rest their team. But judging from the team that they chose um, this this previous weekend, I think this is going to be the big guns that are playing against Bordeaux. And yeah, Bordeaux, they're starting to make a bit of a run now in the in the top 14. I, I I would doubt that they'd send, you know, their their big guns away from home, but they do need the win. So this might be a very interesting game and possibly, possibly we'd we'd get, you know, the likes of Matty Jalibe coming over to Durban, but that's quite unlikely. So Sharks probably <laughs> need a win, if not just a few bonus points in there through to the last 16. Stormers and the Bulls, yeah, they they're they're not they're not they're sitting in a decent position, but they'll probably need at least one win from these two games. Bulls don't mm. have a great points difference because of that big loss to Exeter. So this game against Exeter Loftus, they probably need to get, you know, maximum points if they if they want to qualify and qualify well. Stormers, on the other hand, you know, they should fancy their chances beating London Irish at um at at, at away from home, but Irish are, are a very, yeah, a very, very, very difficult team to beat, and they're almost like the Stormers of England. They are more than happy to throw the ball around and and to to attack from deep and have some really good attacking players. So, yeah, Jared, I think these are three massive games: um, Sharks mm. against Bordeaux, Bulls against Exeter, and, and Irish against Stormers. I, I'm not sure which one's the game, the pick of the weekend, but all three are possible. Are less so for the Sharks, but for the other two, are probably must wins. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you could probably say it's a must win for all of them. I mean, if you look at the uh, teams above the Sharks, if they want to try to finish quite high up in the uh, Champions Cup, it's going to be very difficult for them. I mean, they've got Leinster, Exeter and Saracens, all three are winners in recent times of the competition. So, so yeah, if they want to finish right on top of the, the table, it seems a bit difficult for them now. But yeah, I, th- I think that's something that they'll aim to do. So. I think uh, all four teams will be going, uh, or all, four, all three South African teams will go full throttle this weekend and the weekend after and sort of see how far they can go. I think if the Bulls um, slip against Exeter, they might just uh, give up on the Champions Cup um, for this yeah. season and come back fighting next year. And you, could, you can't really blame them if they did that. Um, I think the Stormers could maybe um, survive with a, with a small loss, but... Uh, it would make things a lot a very difficult for them in the last weekend. So, so yeah, I, I would say that the Sharks Bordeaux game is uh, probably the the pick of pick of the lot, and uh, just because, like you say, we might get to see Jelly Bear. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, we look. Uh, if anyone from Bordeaux is listening, we're not asking for a lot. You know, yeah. just put in you know one of the best flowers in the world in your team. And yeah, you can really put and anyone else around him. I'd be very happy. Yeah, you can even play Cordero at Scrum Off again. We won't moan. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we really won't mind. I mean, if Mofane also can make the trip, great. But yes. yeah, I, I don't know if we'll be able to see those that 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 sort of team. Because I don't think Charlie Bird played in the home game, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was Zach Holmes that played in that um, yes. first yeah. Sharks game. Yeah, and, and he didn't Sharks play this weekend was, as well, so... Mm. So it doesn't look too likely. Um, but yeah, I also quite like the um, Tate prop, Vadim uh, Kobolas, 35 years old, and he just looks like a proper Tate prop. <laughs> Fully shaved, big, heavy man. <laughs> yeah, look, another favorite of mine is, and he played a little bit for France in the July series, is Thomas um, Jones. Um, you know, quite a wild mm. head mm. lock. And yeah, I think... If you're a wild head lock, usually it, 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 it says good things about you because you're you, you're not someone that can hide in a game because we can see like in this case that's 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 a big um, bush of hair on his head, yeah, and he seems to have a big engine and and can get around. So if he's on the team for Saturday, him playing as Evan Etzebeth will be quite interesting. And of course, Mado Shambwe is in this team too. So of course, pos- yeah, I think he'll probably make the trip to South Africa. Just at least to see some some friends and some family coming down here. 
No, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I normally liken Van or Cork to Sartre uh, Bob from The Simpsons, but uh, Thomas Shams <laughs> definitely takes the cake when it comes to that. Yeah. And this is also the Yannick Brew derby because, you know, rumors are yeah. to be believed. I don't know if it's confirmed yet, Jared. Is he the, uh, the, been the French? As the, coach? Are, the French are running it as fact. So I don't think he has been okay. confirmed yet. But uh, yeah, the French. Uh, papers all pretty much running it as he's taken over from next season okay so yeah this is a, a nice game also for Yannick Brew just to see how his future team is doing Storm is Irish going to be also a great game it was quite good yeah. also um, in Cape Town um, a month ago and yeah the likes of Ben Loder playing well um, they, you know they have so, so many really talented um, players at Irish that are just you know crazy attacking um, attacking uh, crazy in, in attack. They've also got the fascia of like Ita- um, uh, Argentinian players and Lucio Sinti. And um, as Sean has messaged to us, the most informed number 12 in the competition, as he calls him, um, Bernard Janssen van Rensburg is playing well. I think he's actually going to be English qualified this year, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'm, I'm not too sure about that, to be honest. Uh, mm. uh, it's, it's, it's about four years now, five years now, isn't it? Yeah, how many years have they got I it? I think he, yeah, he's probably close. If not, it's this year or it might be next year. But yeah, they played a quite a good game in um in in December in in South Africa. They're doing quite, you know, they're doing okay. I think considering their um resources in the in the Premiership, they they are near the bottom. But you know, they beat Bristol this weekend, twenty three points to seven. They beat Bath the week before, so you would yeah, I think they they. They, 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 they're probably still coming up the, the ranks there. Don't think Harry Arundel is going to be ready for this game. And if I'm not mistaken, Paddy Jackson has also now gotten injured. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, but yeah, they, they have got a quite good depth. Um, Jackson's obviously a big, big player for them. And if he's out, um, yeah, he. I think he played the most minutes for the uh, for the Exiles last season. So yeah, it's, he's mm-hmm. a very important player. That their game revolves around him, and uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it will be a crushing blow if he's uh, not ready for this match for the for them. Yeah, but it's no worries. You can play one Martin Gonzalez at fly half. But that, that, yes, that you can do issue. anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then just lastly, Exeter. Yeah, they've I think started to really crank up their form um, in in the Premiership. They're I think starting to climb up in, in in the standings. They're sixth at the moment. They've got thirty points or fifth, sorry, with thirty points there. But yeah, they they well within contention to 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 get into the top three um, sooner rather than later. But I think they started, if I'm not mistaken, Jared, they started not great, but now they're really picking up mm. form. And their main players are playing well, and it seems like it's a last dance type of situation for them. With, you know, Luke Cowan Dick yeah. is leaving after this season, so and and Sam Simmons. So this this they they'll probably want to 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 go far in 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 in, in the in the Champions Cup and and try to see if they can go as far as possible. And yeah, in the last game that they played against the Bulls, where they completely thrashed them, I mean. Henry Slade and Solomon Carter, I think, were the ones leading the 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 right that they led. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you spot on with that. And yeah, you ran off a few names, but uh, it looks like Jack Noel is also going to be leaving the team. So yeah, it's yes. guys that have sort of come up uh, through their academies. And uh, one of their goals be- before they got uh, promoted into the Premiership and then eventually winning the Premiership was to obviously uh, win the Champions Cup. So if they are having this uh, last last chance saloon, then yeah, they'll be firing on all cylinders to take the Champions Cup, and yeah, the, they'll be looking to rampage the Bulls first. Yeah, so three big games, and obviously the Champions Cup has a lot of other quality games. Yeah, hopefully all teams sort of bring their into the bargain, and at least for this weekend, try try to play their their top teams. We're looking at you, French teams. Please play your best players, <laughs> and yeah, we should be <laughs> we should be set for a really good weekend of games. I think the pick of the other games is Selvers to lose. Selvers in yeah. hot form at the moment to lose. I think they rested some of their players for that La Rochelle game that we talked about earlier. 
So I think they're targeting this game to make a statement and they're playing away in Manchester. So I think that will probably be a titanic battle between two of the four or five best sides in Europe at the moment, probably, if I'm so bold to say. Yeah. So yeah, that would be a good game. Fair. Gloucester versus Leinster as well will be really good. Yeah, uh, uh, I think you're spot on. Uh, so, uh, there's also La Rochelle versus Ulster. Ulster have been struggling a bit. Um, I think if they mm. get their act together, they can make that into a very entertaining game. Um, yeah, Ulster, it's just been a poor run of form of late. I don't think uh, they started the season. Pr- uh, they did start the season pretty well and they're just having like a mid-season slum. So, yeah, and uh, it'll be also be interesting to see if uh, Ospreys can back up their victory over Montpellier the last time out and uh, mm. manage to to topple them at home as well. Yeah, and then also Saracens versus Leon, most likely without Owen Farrell. Um, as we saw this yeah. weekend, he probably got away with a red card in that game against um, Gloucester, and then he kicked the winning <laughs> drop kick at the end as well. Of course, so he yeah, did. unfortunately. Farrell doesn't really beat those allegations with, with regards to his tackling, so we'll probably hear the disciplinary um, results um, in the next few days. Yeah, and I think the the last one that we haven't really touched on was uh, is Castres are playing against uh, Edinburgh, and there's a very good chance we might see Rory Crockett uh, play again. So, Ooh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I say that, he came off the bench. He's been coming off the bench quite a bit for for Cass, so he'll probably do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a bit funny when, you know, like a, a, a club like that, you know, they have such a bad injury crisis that they need to rely on someone that just retired that's now part of their coaching staff. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, you, it's not you a say bad that, but it's, to fall up. Uh, it's very French for them to do that. It's, it's very, very French. No, um, <laughs> that's also very true. Yeah, they have a club Morgan with Pyro, Sergio... Yes. Yeah. The, Did the club with them um, Arata um in their squad, right? Yes. Yes. And he's oh, injured yeah. now. And that's why yes. he came out of retirement. But uh Para is retiring at the end of this season, but they put in him he's going into <laughs> a coaching role, but he might retire at the end of the season and come back as medical joker before um if Brad <laughs> Weber makes the all black squad. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the joys of French rugby. But yeah, great okay? um Champions Cup and sorry, go ahead, Jared. No, that's it, man. <laughs> yes, I think yeah, I think we can wrap up there. Great Challenge Cup and Champions Cup um, rugby to look forward to, and yeah, I think we are all set for another good um, weekend of rugby. So, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us in the Rugby Bits Podcast, the first one for twenty twenty three. Um, we are looking forward to some awesome rugby. We're gonna um, do a, a nice big debrief of these big European matches um, after this week and yeah looks hopefully we will have five South African teams that are still in contention to qualify for um, the knockouts after this so thank you from Jared and myself have a great one bye